Welcome to the regular council meeting of uh, September the 8th to, or September the 3rd, 2019. Uh, one notice, council will hold a public meeting, planning meeting on Tuesday, September 17th to discuss a proposal zoning amendment application concerning six lots at the Net in the Netty Lake area. We'll have a moment of silence. Approval of the agenda. It's moved by Councillor Stacy White, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier, that Council approves the agenda for its regular meeting held September 3rd, 2019, as presented. All in favor? Unanimous. Passed. Uh, declaration of pecuniary interest. Councillor White. I'm declaring for item 6VIII I, and bylaws 19-091. 19-092 as it involves a property um, owned by my father. Duly noted. Thank you. Uh, petitions and delegations. None declared. <laughs> Acceptance of minutes and uh, recommendations. It's moved by Councillor Dennis Perrier, seconded by Councillor Stacy White, that Council accepts the minutes of the following meetings. The inaugural meeting of the Kirkland Lake Recreation Committee held May 8th, or May 9th, sorry, 2019, and the meeting held July 9th, 2019. The 100th Anniversary Committee um, Executive Meeting held August 6, 2019. The meeting to open seal tenders for the supply of two three-quarter ton trucks held August 13th, 2019, and the regular meeting of council held August 13th, 2019. All in favor? Passed unanimous. Uh, reports of municipal officers and communications. Councillor Rick Owen. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Last, uh, I just want to say that uh, Bob uh, Panaman wanted to be here tonight, but since his stroke, he's unable to appear in public uh, ceremonies that uh, causes him a great deal of stress. Um, I first met with Bob a couple of weeks ago, and uh, for those who don't know Bob, he's an internationally recognized artist. He's most famous for his uh, Arctic uh, landscape paintings. His paintings are in collections all around the world, and at the age of 85, he's still avidly painting. Um, you probably wouldn't be able to buy any of his paintings for less than $3,000, and that's just for uh, a standard painting. Um, he is a listed artist with the Art Gallery of Canada, so he's, he's well known internationally and across Canada for his work. Um, Bob's stepfather was a very active in the local baseball scene as well. He was a, a, a bit of a local character, and I will get into that as well. Um, at, uh, prior to coming to uh, Kirkland Lake, Johnny Stoyan was a semi-professional baseball player, and he played with the uh, Regina Nationals um, from 1932. To 1936, and that's during the Depression, and at that time the team folded. Um, the Regina Nationals were affiliated with the New York Yankees, <clears throat> and he did try out for the New York Yankees. While he didn't make it, his proudest moment was when he was able to steal home plate on catcher Billy Dickey. Now, I don't know my baseball history all that well, but apparently in the day, Billy Dickey was the hardest uh, catcher to steal a base from, and uh, that's something that he he didn't let people forget. Um, when he moved to Kirkland Lake, he moved to play with the Mines teams. At that time, uh, Wright Hargraves had a team, Toburn had a team, and 
There was one other mine, I can't think of it right now. When those teams folded, um, Johnny went on to <coughs> found and, and form the Kirkland Lake Greyhounds, where he was both a, he was a player coach. They won seven senior Northern Ontario baseball titles. Um, he, uh, he coached a number of uh, people that went on to play in the NHL, including Larry Hillman. Um, he coached Joe Mavernack. He coached uh, Frankie Malone. Um, so he was well known in the community. He was also an avid curler and uh, would have gone to the Bri Briars except for a man named Ramsey who went on to win so uh, I don't think that's any shame that he didn't make it to the to the Briar um, now to get to some of the other things oh he also coached Ricky uh, Mickey Redmond as well um, Bob was telling me that on one trip and this was not unusual uh, Bob went along with his father as the bat boy and after the uh, the game when it was time to go to the restaurant uh, the mines hadn't given them enough money for their meals so Johnny just reached into his pocket and covered all the team's meals and, and apparently this uh, this happened quite often um, now to get to the some of the more interesting things um, we're not quite sure exactly how short Johnny was, but it was either 5'4 or 5'6. In other words, he wasn't a big man. He was missing a finger on his right hand, but fortunately for him, he was a left-handed baseball player, so that hand was in the glove. It didn't affect his game. But what I find the most interesting was, in, in addition to being a professional baseball player, he was also a professional gambler. And the whole time that he lived in Kirk and Lake, he ran a gambling room. And Bob said every night his dad would put on a suit, put on a hat, and go to the gaming room. And uh, the only, he only got Bob's original, him in the original conversation, in Bob's words, pinched once. And the feeling was the police kind of turned a blind eye because of all the other things he did in the community and, in, and for the sports. Uh, oh yeah, it was Lakeshore that had the, the third team. If my notes were in order, but they're kind of like by mind, they're scrambled, so they just come out. Um, Johnny died in 1960, and in 1970, he was inducted into the Saskatchewan Sports Hall of Fame. Um, so he lived in Kirk Lake a lot longer than he lived in, uh, in Saskatchewan. And uh, that's, that's quite an honor to be inducted into any uh, Hall of Fame. It just shows you the significance he played in that community as well. So Bob uh, has a a picture, photograph, of his dad on the bases. Apparently, before every game, he'd go to every base and check and make sure it was placed right and to the right measurements. That was part of his ritual. And uh, from that, he painted a portrait. The portrait is valued at between three and four thousand dollars. And he has donated that portrait to the town of Kirkland Lake with the idea of it being hung in the lobby of the Kirkland Lake Community Complex. So, Joanne, if you could get the painting now, please.
resolution that uh, I've been asked to read. It's uh, moved by Councillor Rick Owen, seconded by Councillor Stacy White. The Council accept the artwork donation from Mr. Rob Pannanen, and the Council recommend to staff that wall space in the complex reception area be used to display the picture. Discussion? Just a point. Um, we do also have the Hall of Fame in the museum where you have uh, a clim clim climate controlled as well and it would not fit with the accessioning process and there is usually a recommendation process as well that goes in but just suggesting that that could be another uh, setting. Councillor Owens. Yes I did talk to the artist about climate control and he's not concerned all about it. <coughs> it is an acrylic painting with a heavy clear coat of varnish on it to protect it from the environment. Uh, his feeling was that we are losing our sports history and I kind of agree with him. Um, during this, my discussions with him and with another Kirkland Lake person who was at town hall this year. They both brought up a uh, boxer whose last name was Williams. I, he had a nickname, I forget what the nickname Kid was. Williams, yep. Kid Williams. And you know, when I moved to Kirkland Lake in 82, I used to hear stories about him. Now I don't hear anything. And the idea of putting in the complex was that that gave it high visibility. The complex is the recreation sports center in the town. and that that part of our history would not be lost there. But he had absolutely no concerns. He goes to the complex every day and walks. He knows what the humidity is. So he has no concerns about the humidity or the climate, the temperature. Okay. Any further comments? All in favor? Passed. Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, hockey, or, sorry, Heritage North Interim uh, Facility Manager. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, in full and with the art theme uh, <laughs> today. <laughs> uh, here to present an exciting opportunity for the lounge at Heritage North, a group of professional artist to which we call the Kirkland Lake Arts Club has expressed an interest in donating a mural to the lounge for um, kind of an appreciation for the town's past support for uh, their efforts uh, and I'll have to read this out because this has actually been an educational uh, uh, I've learned quite a bit in, in speaking with them but uh, a triptych uh, measuring 10 feet by 45 inches uh, this would be completed on uh, finished plywood and it will be removable so it'll be attached to the wall by method of dovetail slot and groove. Um, it will embrace the rich heritage of Kirkland Lake, um, what it has to offer to its residents as well as tourists. Um, the past will be represented in a silhouette in the background at the top and then uh, concepts of the present so for example the complex something new in the forefront and a little bit of the depiction of the future as well. Um, they also wanted to include the environment as well. So for the four seasons are going to span horizontally, starting left to right. Um, a number of great professional artists here, which I'm sure some of us have been privileged to uh, see some of their work. Um, the uh, sort of a little bit of background currently right now in the lounge we have a five by 12 foot ish uh, large picture frame and inside that um, a signature board bearing signatures of uh, notable individuals that visited the facility when it was a hockey museum uh, so there's about 60 signatures on that board or about one-fifth of the board is filled um, we actually identified some minor damage to the frame, uh, so that's how this opportunity arose. Uh, and in fixing um, uh, the frame itself, we had removed the panels and then uh, this opportunity for perhaps something 
uh, a little bit more colorful uh, came about. So um, Heritage North's expenses would be limited to just the purchase of supplies, uh, the wood, uh, paints and brushes as well, estimated about $230. And this would be drawn from the operating budget um, allocated to facility maintenance. Comments, discussion? I have a resolution. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Councillor Owen. So, from your uh, presentation, you mentioned that it was a removable piece, right? Yes. So, if we were to sell or repurpose that building again and the piece of artwork was not appropriate for it, would maintain it would be removed or could be removed if we sold the building and maintained property of the town, Cork and Lake? Yes, exactly. Okay, thank you. It's moved okay. by Councillor Dennis Perrier, seconded by Councillor Rick Owen. The Council approves the installation of a mural produced by the Cork and Lake Arts Council in the Heritage North Lounge area. All in favor? Unanimous. Passed. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Sherry, on the 2019 tax uh, booklet. There isn't much to this one. It's just one of the standard things that we do each year now that the financial statements have been completed and they were approved at the August 13th meeting. So what we do is we just do up, a, it used to be a booklet, but now to save costs, we put it on the website. We will have a few copies downstairs in case somebody wants to look at them on the counter. Um, but that will pretty much complete 2018. So the financial statements, the FIR has been filed as well with the ministry, so that is complete as well. So just in case there's any questions, but other than that, this is just mainly like I said, a housekeeping task. I'd, I'd just like to note, uh, sorry, Councillor White. I just wanted to thank Sherry and the rest of the team for just being so fabulous with us as a new council and with the public as well. I don't think we've ever seen a more transparent and thorough process and you've been so patient with us as we learned. So thank you so much for doing everything you did. I <coughs> did of for that uh, I agree and it's nice that you've kind of outlined what uh, during the uh, budget process uh, what uh, council's objectives were so hopefully we can meet that so thank you Sherry yeah it's moved by Councillor Dennis Perrier seconded by Councillor Stacy White the council approves the booklet 2018 financial review and the 2019 budget and that the treasurer make it available to the public online and at town hall. All in favor? Approved. Joanne? Okay, so this is a request. It's a letter that comes in every year from Crook and Lake Pro-Life. They do what's called their uh, pro-life chain, which is when um, a group of people stand on the sidewalks along Government Road between Oaks Avenue and McChesney. They do it for an hour uh, between two and three in an afternoon on a Sunday and they're looking for council to just endorse that it's okay for them to do this on Sunday, October 6th, um, 2019. Councillor uh, Owens. Since they're not blocking traffic, excuse me, they're not blocking traffic, it's not impeding anything uh, for normal flow on government road, is it absolutely necessary for us to even have to approve this or something? That could this just be done through administration or just do it, do as you see fit without necessarily getting their support for it? Definitely. This is just, uh, this is something that, that uh, I believe they probably started many, many years ago just to bring um, in, you know, just some kind of knowledge to what they're doing. Um, it, it is not something that needs a parade permit. They do not need, uh, nothing needs to be blocked off. 
if it's council's direction that the council that staff deal with administratively, then we can do that also. I feel it's something like 27 years, things have changed a lot. I think it's time to, just doesn't need to come through council. That's my opinion on this one. Councillor White. Um, I definitely agree with Casey. There's nothing actually political that we need to make a decision on um, with this particular thing. It's a group of individuals wanting to stand on a sidewalk. They're not asking us for any permits or anything. So this isn't something that we need to make a decision on. It could definitely fall within the day-to-day -day, uh, scope of administration. Councillor Owen. Yeah, in Canada, we have the privilege of uh, freedom of assembly and freedom of speech. And so they don't even need to ask the town's permission um, as long as they're not obstructing uh, the day, day operations of the sidewalk or roadway. Um, under the Constitution, they have every right to go out there. And I agree with Casey, it's something I hadn't thought of before, but it doesn't need to come to council and probably shouldn't come to council in the future. Um, I guess my problem with it coming to council is that some ratepayers could take it as an endorsement of a certain political stance, which some of us may have, some of us may not have, but certainly the town doesn't have a stand on it. So by keeping it away from council meetings, it will keep away any misconceptions about uh, where council stands on the issues. Uh, I agree. I don't think they're officially requesting uh, support or uh, permission, so because it's not required. So we acknowledge we received it. It's moved by Councillor Stacy White, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier. The request from Kirkland Lake Pro Life is an event uh, will be carried out in a peaceful, pacifist manner and will take place on public sidewalks, not requiring the closure of any road. Therefore, council refers the request from the Kirkland Lake Pro-Life to the clerk to handle administratively. All in favor? Passed. Fire Chief Rob Adair, sole sourcing the truck cap for the fire rescue truck. Good afternoon. Yeah, I'm here to ask to authorize a sole source purchase for the truck cap for the rescue unit. 75000 has been budgeted in capital for the purchase of the truck. An RFP has gone out for the purchase of the truck. It's estimated to be around 45000 The price of the cap, approximately 10000 and lights would be around 6000 keeping us within budget. The cap is a specialized piece of equipment for specific firefighting, firefighting applications to which no one else is capable of supplying. The exact cap is custom fabricated for the OFM by Weber's Fabrication. Uh, we could write up a request for proposal and find three people to quote on something similar because the cap is custom fabricated specific to the OFM or we could go with a, a sole purchase. Any comments, uh, Councillor White, or so, sorry, Councillor Owen? Um, is this just for the cap alone? Just the cap alone. Okay. Now, the equipment that you require for this uh, type of vehicle, do we already have that equipment? We already have the equipment. Okay. Yeah. Um, normally, I am totally against sole sourcing anything when it comes to spending corporation's money, the taxpayer's money. In this case, because it's such a specialized piece of equipment, and I do believe that the approximate price is a reasonable price for a custom fabricated cap, uh, I would be supporting uh, the idea of going to sole source sourcing. But don't get excited about that because it's not something I normally do. Don't order the new fire truck, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Yet. <laughs> Any other comments? 
moved by Councillor Dennis Perrier, seconded by Councillor Stacy White, that Council approves the sole source purchase of a cap for the fire department three quarter ton truck from Weber's Fabrication as presented in the report by the fire chief. All in favor? Unanimous, passed. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Bonnie Sackrider, Director of Community Services. Good afternoon. On occasion, various departments within the town get requests for passes or um, something that they are able to give away to a specific group. So this is one of those situations. And during last year when we did budget, um, Council wanted to make sure that Council was aware of any time that giveaways have happened and we made sure that we tracked them and we accounted for them and that they certainly could be um, tracked under the community grant. So this is one of those requests that has come forth. It is from the Northern College Students Association and they are looking for passes to the complex and to the museum for their frosh kits. So school started today and they are fine if, if this does get approved to give out the passes um, later this week. And uh, the value is there. What we are suggesting if council does want to approve something like this, that the value of the passes that are turned in go against community grants. So both the museum and the complex are able to track how many passes have come in from something like this and then that value would be put against community grants. Any comments, uh, Councillor Adams? Yep, certainly in favor if we're going to track it that way, that's what I was going to ask anyways. So if we track them and uh, you know, use 100, then that's pretty good. So it's a great welcome to our community and show off our amenities to the students in our area. So, Councillor Owens? I'm uh, not a big fan of this simply because most of the students when they graduate are going to leave the community. That's a given. Second off, we got people in this community that are taxpayers, hardworking people that are just getting by. And if we were to give away uh, free passes, I'd rather see them go to the people that are actually supporting the upkeep, maintenance, and staffing of the facility than people that are here for uh, nine months a year. Um, when I went to college and when I went to university, we certainly didn't get free passes to museums. We didn't get free passes to the complex. Uh, Northern College has its own gym facility. I believe it still has its own weightlifting facility, um, as did the colleges and the university, as did the college and the university I went to. Um, I think that's where the students should work out if they want to work out, and that doesn't cost the taxpayer anything. And so I'm not in favor of, of giving away, uh, even if it's in the terms of lost revenue, uh, freebies. Um, to temporary residents. Councillor Casey. Uh, I'd have to agree with Councillor Adams on this one. If we're tracking it, uh, I think it's a good initiative to um, try and promote the community. A lot of colleges and universities in Ontario uh, have these types of programs with municipalities where they offer free bus passes or some type of pass to the amenities they have. We don't have a bus services, so a bus service, so this would be the next best thing. And I think if we want Norton College to survive in Kirk Lake, we also have to, I don't know, no, I don't see necessarily as a freebie, but it's an incentive to, to, to encourage students to come to Kirk Lake, whether they plan on staying here or not, but I, I think it's a good, uh, good initiative. Councillor Ivanov? I also agree with, uh, Councillor Adams, I think it's a great way of uh, sampling our facility. I think people uh, from Northern College, especially for our students, are, they're, they're new to Kirk and Lake. Great way of them having a chance to look at the complex and maybe down the road buy a membership if they want to. Or, uh, so it's a, I think it's a, a great way of uh, uh, promoting and advertising uh, and helping out Northern College at the same time. Thank you. Bonnie, correct me if I wasn't listening. If you can slap my wrist. Did you are these tracked as to how many are actually used? Do we they will track have it, yes. they been used in the full hundred in, um, in the past? They're requesting a hundred. So they did yeah. do this last year, and um, 
we had multiple years that we were collecting at the same time, so we didn't track year to year. We had about 60 that came in over a, probably a three year period. So, okay. but we will track them for just, we'll have them dated for this year. So we'll be able to report back to council exactly how many came in at both locations. Yeah. I, I agree with my fellow councillors that it's uh, certainly, uh, it's a welcome to the community and uh, for the out of towners coming in and uh, for the local uh, students as well to use it. Uh, we do support the college and we certainly want to keep it here so I do support it any further comments oh councillor Perrier um, I have to side with uh, councillor Rick on this because I think we turned down people from Kirk and Lake looking for stuff and yeah. we go and give uh, passes out to temporary people so uh, I, I can't see justifying that so, thank you councillor Owens yeah Joanne can I have a recorded vote on this please Yay. Councillor Ivanov, yay or nay? Yay. Councillor Rick Owen, yay or nay? Nay. Councillor Casey Owens, yay or nay? Yay. Councillor Dennis Perrier, yay or nay? Nay. Councillor Stacy White, yay or nay? Yay. Uh, Mayor Pat Kiley, yay or nay? Yay. So we have five yays and two nays, so it passes. Passed as presented. Thank you. Manager of Planning and Land Development, or designate, Rick Champagne. Charbonneau, change your He's drinking early. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. So the, my, my first report tonight is to request the, uh, the fall free residential tipping fees for 2019 being September 23rd to September 29th. Uh, the fall free tipping fees came into place in 2011 and in essence has become a tradition in Kirkland Lake. Um, it affords the residents an opportunity to get rid of some of the, like in the spring, uh, get rid of some of their unwanted trash uh, without the added cost in the fall, some accumulation over the summer. Um, we're also requesting uh, additional staff hours on Sunday, September 29th from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. to better facilitate those that uh, can't make it out other than on the weekends. Um, we will if, if, if so council chooses, we will offer the, uh, the electronics drop-off bin at, on Dunfield as well for the, for the week period. So the options are to offer the, uh, the fall free tipping from uh, September 23rd to September 29th or to not offer that. Any questions? Just to clarify, uh, Rick, when we were doing curb pickup, those costs amounted to close to 80000 Absolutely. And when we did curbside in the spring, uh, the fall free tipping didn't exist. It was just spring curbside. That was it until the following year. Uh, when they abolished the, um, due, to f due to cost, um, the curbside collection, they brought in the, the, the additional free tipping fees in the week in the fall. So we have two weeks in the spring, one week in the fall. Councillor Ivanov? Yeah, no, I think we should uh, 
continue with the uh, free tipping, uh, get rid of some of the uh, refuse that's kicking around people's yards. I think uh, it's time that we gave uh, Kirkland Lake residents uh, a little bit back after uh, some of the uh, uh, bad PR we've had in the last uh, couple of weeks. I think this wouldn't be uh, harmful at all. I think uh, uh, there's lots of uh, people that can use uh, uh, the free tipping to get rid of some of this garbage. It would be normally sit around till spring and then they'll get rid of it when their free tipping comes in the spring. So I think it's a great idea. It's moved by Councillor Dennis Perrier, seconded by Councillor Stacy White. The Council approves fall free residential tipping fees at the Kirkland Lake Landfill site from September 23rd to September 29th, 2019. And the Council approves the electronic drop off event location. All in favor? Unanimous. You're still on, Rick. My next report is to do with the cyclical review of the instrument approaches at the uh, at the airport, um, and that council um, approve and engage Octant Aviation for the amount of twenty-two thousand two hundred eighty-three dollars and uh, sixty cents to perform that. Um, Nav Canada used to be the governing body that would perform this at no charge to to airports. Um, and it's a subsidiary of Transport Canada. Um, since that time, uh, around 2016, 2017, NAV Canada announced that they will no longer be doing that service for us uh, at all, free of charge or otherwise. And that we'd have to source out uh, companies that could perform that. And wh what it is is the, the airport has three instrument approach landing procedures, uh, two on uh, runway 26 and one on runway 08. And it's a series of, of flight patterns through the circuit uh, that they complete to verify and uh, assure accuracy in our publications and that uh, ensures confidence uh, for pilots when they fly in and out of uh, Kirkland Lake. Um, we, we, did, we did go to RFP, we had three submissions. Octant is preferred, um, they've been here before, they know the airport. Uh, we're pretty satisfied that they'll be able to complete this in a timely manner. We uh, we do have a through our budget uh, deliberations we have twenty five thousand dollars in operating for this review, um, so it comes well within budget. And uh, this is something that we're going to have to do every five years. So Octant will maintain it. Should we hire them or one of the other ones, they uh, they'll maintain it for five years, and then we we'll have to go back out to RFP again. If, if we don't do this, then we can't publicize what our instrument approaches are. Um, rendering the airport daylight hours, sunny skies, uh, flights only. Uh, these procedures are, are instrument flight rules. Uh, so a pilot doesn't necessarily have to see where he's going. He's got all his, his gauges, his instruments telling him where the ground is, the right trajectory, and he can land safely with his eyes closed and take off safely with his eyes closed. If we don't do it, they can't do that. Then it's just daylight hours, sunny skies. Councillor Owen. Yeah, uh, Richard, when was the last time this work was done? Do you this, know? This is actually the first time we've had to go out and hire somebody for it okay. because traditionally NAV Canada would do that for us and they would automatically correspond with Transport Canada and they'd update our publications that no fee whatsoever to us. Okay. But being a government service, it, it has been downloaded onto the municipality. Yeah, yeah. So. And you answered my other question. You have the money in the budget. It's not an add-on. So it's, uh, it's in operating. Yeah. I, I certainly would support this uh, so we can maximize the uh, revenue out of the airport. Councillor Ivanov? Does this affect your ambulance also, Rick? It, it, it definitely would. Um, we, we get a lot of air ambulances during the dark hours um, and that right there uh, without this they, they won't come in okay I support you also thank you councillor Perrier <coughs> well basically what you're saying is this is a safety concern it's a safety concern uh, for the pilots and, and those involved in aviation um, definitely it gives them confidence uh, if they can't see the runway they know if they set their instruments at, at those coordinates they're, they're going to come in safely yeah. 
and they can take off safely without hitting a tower, trees, mountains, anything that could be. Well, there's there's a couple right in our, our flight path. So it's basically something we really can't overlook. Then. You can't overlook, not if you want to run it uh, the way we've been running it. Thank you. Any further comments, questions? That'll come back as a bylaw. Ashley Billado. All right, I have a few to get through tonight, so I'm going to try and make them a little quicker. And if there's questions, by, by all means, ask away. Uh, the first one is a request to purchase six lots around 17 Hilton Avenue. Uh, the purpose of purchasing the land was to install a permanent water service line over the properties. Uh, we are recommending approval of the land sale. Uh, it's very unlikely that those lots were going to be developed. They are unserviced pieces of land. Uh, topographical issues um, and and heavily vegetated vegetated at this point um, so at this point we are recommending that council proceed with uh, with uh, signing an agreement for purchase and sale with the owners or with the potential purchasers sorry Ashley is it safe to say or reasonable to say this property is basically useless to anybody else depends on how much somebody would like to spend in order to be make it useful without yeah. spending a small fortune yeah I don't yeah. think you're going to see development on those we did retain uh, the intent was for the two pieces that are closer to Branch Street to be retained uh, as those were the most developable pieces in our mind that's coming back as a bylaw bylaw enforcement update this was a request from council to get an update on bylaw enforcement. I also included property standards as part of this uh, this update. So t um, since TIPS has started about three months ago, we've we've had about 80 activity requests lodged. Uh, 60 of them have been resolved, and there are approximately 12 minor bylaw infractions that we're currently working with. There, if you do the math, there's about eight that are outstanding from a, a clean yards community standards perspective and two property standards uh, issues that are, are very prevalent that we're trying to deal with right now. So um, I did put uh, a little bit of a table together. Uh, you're going to notice that if you calculate it, the phone calls and inquiries received are not going to add up to 80. That's because there was multiple phone calls on maybe one property. So the 80 represents 80 properties. Uh, tickets issued, it does not include the tickets issued from the OPP. This is just tips. I wanted to also mention that they've also been working on the licensing of all taxi vehicles and um, and sort of patrolling the streets for parking enforcement as well. So as I'd mentioned previously, we have about 10 major property issues that we are that are in violation that we are dealing with. And we did um, we did commence the or commissioned the cleanup uh, of two properties so far. That is going to be back, charged back to the properties or the rule files or the rule uh, the tax rules. Uh, there's one more cleanup pending, depending on uh, what happens with the uh, response that we've, or that we get from the owner. Uh, there are a couple of property standards issues that are being reviewed by legal, and their course of action is going to be evaluated by staff to determine next steps. So they're in the works. So not, there's no decision to be made. It's just a general update for you guys and the public to say that we are moving ahead with this. Questions, concerns? Councillor Rowan. Yeah. Okay, most, most of the action taken by TIPS is complaint uh, started. Uh, my concern is especially with parking in the wintertime. How much time is uh, TIPS dedicated, dedicating to the town for, say, parking enforcement along Government Road where we have uh, those new no, no parking signs up now telling them what months they can't park? Um, how much time are they going to be spending on uh, overnight parking once we have our overnight parking restrictions in place uh, is, is that are all these things going to be just strictly complaint oriented or do we have a specific uh, amount of time we're going to get from them because especially the government road one um, to me that's a big safety factor and in fact one of our firefighters thanked me after we passed that because he said 
when you're driving the fire truck it's in the winter time through there it's very very difficult and without cars on that side it'll make a huge difference for them make it safer for them so um, the overnight thing I'm not as concerned about because I, I think the OPP traditionally have dealt with that and probably would continue to but they're being downloaded on too so they may not have the manpower and, and we may have to rely on tips to uh, enforce that as well so I, I, I'd like you to uh, either answer it now which I don't think you probably can which is fine I understand or uh, to come back to an open council meeting with with answers to those questions so the public will know that yes we are going to enforce yeah, yeah. Um, because there's still a feel I, I get the in talking to people I get the feeling that they think they can still get away scot-free mm -hmm. and uh, I want them to know before they get the ticket that no that's not the case so parking is the only one that we would say it, it, they, we do deal with complaints for parking but they are also actively patrolling the streets and tickets are being issued for parking infractions that don't receive a complaint or an activity request generated uh, overnight parking that's definitely something we spoke of two tips already uh, we do plan on having them especially in that uh, first couple weeks where those rules are implemented they, they will be patrolling the street overnight we have special constables that are also working on that um, are we still gonna like the first few days give out yes. uh, mock tickets just to yep. be fair to the residents because yep. they're already upset with us and I don't <laughs> want them to be really upset with us it'll be the same process that we've had for years yeah. Councillor Ivanov uh, Ashley, I just want to remind you that last year we had complaints from, I think it was Federal Tavern and Ferns Restaurant, where she starts work at 3 in the morning and she got tagged by the OPP and the Fe uh, Franklin Tavern. So I just, you know, I don't want tips to go out and go crazy and start tagging people. at guy who pulls in to get chicken wings at uh, midnight at the, F at the Franklin Tavern gets a ticket for stopping in for 15 minutes to get a chicken wing. All right, so I just, you know, to use a little, a little bit of discretion when they're out there doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councillor White. Um, I'm certainly pleased to see um, some of the success that they've had with the community standards. Um, not only does it have a huge impact in the neighborhoods and, and the neighbors um, that are alongside of these issues, but it really does contribute to overall community pride. Um, and as noted, I would completely support um, allocating more funds towards um, the cleanup of these properties in the future 2020 barring any more downloading from <laughs> other levels of government I think really for the sense of community pride and, and over aesthetic of the community we really do have to start getting serious with these community standards issues yeah these comments are a little bit of an extension of what Councillor White is saying uh, and the registration of properties and the delays that have taken place uh, we council had asked for an inventory or at least a count of uh, how many properties are registered and how many that are in a situation time-wise that could be registered because uh, because of the delays in registering and acting on the properties it leads to pigeons and derelict of properties so uh, council would like to see that report I know I'm probably putting somebody on the spot here but I wonder when we might uh, get get that uh, report I think that we can pull it together for the next council meeting it's just a report on uh, the numbers uh, we won't go into details or issues in that, but we could probably get that to you, and uh, we should be able to tell you where we are with uh, real tax at that point, too. <coughs> okay, much appreciated. Any other comments on this subject? <coughs> Community Improvement Plan, I guess? Um, yeah. Or? <laughs> okay, yep, go ahead. <laughs> The, um, so the community improvement plan, we did pass that. Uh, the applications, we have not published to the website at this point. Uh, because there has been no money allocated into uh, the community improvement plan um, budget. So at this point, the community improvement plan specifies that there should be an annual contribution of $50,000. We haven't allocated that money in the 2019 budget. 
I am looking for some direction on how council wants to proceed with hearing applications. So I do know of five individual companies that have approached me about utilizing this, this application process and wanting more information. I've sort of put a, a halt to it until I get some direction from council on how they'd like to proceed. Councillor White. Of course, this would be one of mine. <laughs> um, I would definitely like to see staff work with these companies and bring back a report on the approximate cost that we would be looking at to grant through the 2020 budget. And if we could get a head start on the applications so that when the time comes next year, there'd be no further delays for these companies that are interested. Um, that's the way I would prefer to proceed, that we get some solid numbers from your department on what we're looking at. Excuse me, but Councillor, you're suggesting for 2020, not 2019. Not for 2020, get a report within approximately. Mm -hmm. right with an approximation for 2020 mm -hmm. so that when we go into budget talks we'll know approximately what we should be or what we could be coming up with I if at all possible I, I believe with the consultants they had suggested a lump sum and that breakout uh, we could suggest where we would see most of the demand for that would that mm -hmm. be uh, acceptable yeah oh. yeah yeah and there'll be a couple of these that will not no longer apply because they're doing the work this summer yeah as well mm -hmm. councillor Owen yeah I just wanted to ask do you I know we didn't put any money in the budget for this um, it was a difficult process as you well aware of the budget um, do you think we will any of these uh, people that are interested in applying will not do the work if they don't get the money this year like they'll just leave their storefront or their expansion or mm -hmm. whatever they're they're pressed for time they need to get started on it it they would have been nice to get the money is the way that um but if we wait to approve money until the 2020 budget will that stop any of these projects it might halt them for another year. We, we honestly just can't answer yeah. that because well, that's yeah. everybody individual, yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, you have a feeling like, I mean, generally speaking, when I'm dealing with somebody that's applying for something, you get some sort of feeling. I'm not asking for something written in stone. I'm just concerned, like, okay, we're kind of between a rock and a hard spot here. We don't have the money. We approved the plan. And I'm trying to mm -hmm. see if you, if this, a feeling, that these I projects would feelings, still go ahead. One, yeah. That's all yeah. I'm looking for, not something to hold you to your feet to the fire with. I, I think the other thing too, Councillor Owen, uh, that we should come up with a number in early January because if the budget yeah. process isn't finished until March or April 1st or mid-April, uh, we can't keep these people waiting. It could jeopardize some people going ahead with it so I, I agree with you but I think we can come up with a number preliminary that we would include in the budget uh, in advance at least then we would know where we're going or what uh, at least get a head start on it I will say that uh, we have uh, scheduled a meeting with the economic development uh, committee for mid-month uh, so some of this information has to be passed on to them and any other recommendations that uh, come out of that meeting which we will uh, bring back to council as well councillor Owens yeah well after the way the budget went this year I sincerely hope that we will start the budget process extra early uh, for for 2020 and and present the earliest budget that's ever been presented in this town we I, th I believe as an elected councillor that we owe that to the ratepayers yeah. after what we put them through this year and and uh, you know if you want to start the budget tomorrow I'll be there it started last week actually yeah. I concur <laughs> but for direction there is no allocations for 2019 we plan for 2020 and we would propose a, as per the plan, a $50,000 contribution be 
uh, a $50,000 fund be established that would be used for the CIP for 2020? I, I don't know if we can put that 50 figure to it yet. I, okay. I agree with uh, Councillor White that uh, it, we need an indication of just where we're going, what we need, what the needs are, but certainly to uh, in early January to to uh, come up with a figure, whether it be 50 or 60, whatever, mm -hmm. or less. Is that a fair comment? I think my only concern is that if you have fifty thousand dollars in the budget, it will get spent. If you have twenty, it'll if you be, have it will twenty, be spent. it yeah. will get spent. If you have a hundred, it will get spent. And, yes. and, and uh, sorry, Councillor White. <laughs> Sorry, no, with these five that have already approached you, this is what I was going after, that if okay. you have already five people that were like, I want to jump on board, I want to be part of this, get that number because we. the reality is 2020 may be just as difficult for us as this year was as far as downloading, mm -hmm. et cetera. So if we have between now and January 1st, if you only have these five, then we have a better concrete number of we may only have to allocate the 25 or you know do you understand what i'm yep. getting at yeah. that it's better to base yeah. it on concrete requests than it'll be a good indicator you're right yeah. okay. i agree so it's okay the applications in there. Yeah. okay it's moved by councillor stacy white seconded by councillor dennis perrier the council has received the community improvement plan report from the manager of planning and land development and directs staff to postpone all applications to the fund to be considered as part of the 2020 budget year and that a report from staff with more detail be presented to council before 2020 budget discussions. All in favor? Passed. Unanimous. My next report has to do with updating the terms of reference for the Committee of Adjustment. Uh, the committee recently completed training through the Ontario Association of Committee of Adjustments and Consent Authorities, and with that, became, or they ended up getting a lot more knowledge on uh, the inner workings of the Committee of Adjustment. So as a result of this new knowledge, they requested some modifications to the terms of refer reference. The recommendations are recommended as well by staff to, uh, to Council for updating. Any comments, discussion? Councillor Adams, sorry. Yep, just want to say uh, thank you for showing the changes in the policy. It's one of my favorite things. So thank you for showing that and love it. Thank you. You're welcome. It's moved by Councillor Dennis Perrier, seconded by Councillor Stacy White. The council approves the updated com committee of adjustment terms of references as presented. All in favor? Passed unanimous. The next report deals with a decision that was made by the Committee of Adjustment for a minor variance at Oakley Tire. Uh, the store, um, it was to approve two storage containers on the property. Um, as part of the decision-making process, they added conditions to that approval, uh, and the condition is to formulate an agreement, so for Council to formulate an agreement with the owner to ensure that if the property is no longer being used as part of Oakley Tire's operation, that the storage containers will cease to be uh, on the property. That's just to prevent somebody from purchasing a separate piece of property and using it for storage purposes, which would not be compatible with the zoning bylaw. As long as it maintains an accessory use, um, it was it was it was passed by the committee that they'd be all right with that. The also thing that they wanted added within the agreement was to ensure that the storage containers looked pretty, so that they were painted with similar colors as the business. So those are stipulated in the agreement, and I've attached it for your review. Other concerns. Does this relate to the OK Tire? Uh, I'm a little confused on this one. They already have the container mm -hmm. there. Yes. And now we're looking for minor variants. No, the minor variants has already been approved. It's conditional on the agreement being registered, being signed by council. So they were a little preemptive with placing the container there, but yes, the the agreement is that the decision was passed. That's just the agreement that okay. needs to be finalized. Councillor Owen? I know at the, 
at the committee level there was concern about what these containers would look like well I'm pleased to report that as Ashley said they are very pretty and they are painted in uh, colors similar to what the building is they have a nice advertisement sign on them they're well placed and they're everything that the uh, owner of the business promised would happen um, I'm certainly pleased to see the cooperation we got from that owner and I just want to thank him for living up to his word coming back okay. to government road okay so we received a request from the owners of two government road west they also own uh, a couple of properties adjacent to that which is the park lane uh, to waive tipping fees associated with uh, renovating or retrofitting the building into a hotel so the calculation from what we can gather is about 40 yards of uh, like how many sorry 200 construction bins so 240 yard bins of waste in order to complete the project which results in a total revenue of eighty four thousand dollars so the request would be to waive eighty four thousand dollars worth of revenue for uh, in order to meet the what they're asking so not to get into all the nitty-gritty of the report because I'm sure you've already gone through that um, the recommendation that count or that staff are making to council was to waive a portion of the tipping fees so uh, ensuring that it happens before June of 2020 and maxing out at a total of $25,000 which is approximately 30% of the total amount of tipping fees that they'd be having to pay for and we're also um, requesting that that waste be segregated so they can be placed appropriately in the landfill councillor white that is a lot of money for a municipality that really cannot afford it um, I have asked and I have looked what was the maximum we've ever um, waived in the past I personally by searching came up with five thousand um, dollars so that is a, a very large jump not that on one hand we really want to do uh, what we can for mm -hmm. um, business to come into Kirkland Lake but that is a very very large ask and it's something at this point that I wouldn't be comfortable with because it's so outside of what we set precedent before as a town prior to this Counts. Go ahead. Well, I think it's what uh, staff is wondering too. Uh, just to clarify, uh, the 84 or the 25 or both are too high. Both are too high. Okay. Councillor Owen. <coughs> well, I don't know. Anytime I bought a property, I looked at the property. I knew what I was buying, and I knew what I wanted to do, and I had a rough idea what it was going to cost. And I think any reasonable business person that's buying a property would look at the price of the property, look at the property, um, figure out what his costs are going to be, and then decide whether or not to buy the property. I'm a little, I'm always leery of giving away ratepayers' money, always. And I'm even more leery. Uh, when we're giving away ratepayers money to a for-profit business however this is a double-edged sword because if that property comes back into the hands of the town and we have to tear it down we are probably looking at from what I've heard a million dollars uh, having said that if I was to approve any vote in favor of any discount at all I think Stacy has brought up a good point in the past five thousand dollars has been the ceiling I think uh, when we subtract the five thousand dollars we're still getting seventy nine thousand dollars in revenue from the building I could probably live with that even though in principle I, I don't agree with it 
but because I don't want the town to get the building back, I could live with it. But I, I certainly would not go above anything above $5,000, and I do that reluctantly. Councillor Adams. Um, helping businesses, that's why we kind of already voted to uh, have a community improvement plan, was to help businesses uh, with these kinds of things, and it would come back as to increase value of the assessment, which comes back to more money into our pockets. So it's a small give and take. We have the program. Uh, we just saw in our last one that uh, people are already applying for help to uh, get their businesses going so that we can, uh, in the end, as what we voted for was to get the money back through increased assessments. $80,000 is a little bit way too much. Um, so certainly even in the report it says should council approve this request, it was recommended that approval be conditioned upon a time frame and monetary cap. So kind of discussion on the monetary cap is around 5,000. Uh, what kind of time frame is recommended at this point? We, we would suggest, uh, you know, till the end of June 2020, um, if council sees fit, that, that should be pushed back possibly till the end of August 2020. We'd be okay with that as well, but there should be a, a definite, definite time cap on it. So that would be they would have until June 2020 to do all their demolition and set aside or to get things started? Uh, to actually get everything get everything out of there and, 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 if, and use the approval. To, to use the $5,000 yeah, worth. Yeah. So if we're looking at moving the community improvement plan funding approval to around January, which is 50000 this could possibly be one of those applications that can be decided upon, which is which some of our recommendations. But Councillor Ivanov? Yeah, I... I think, it, I mean, if the demolition had to take place, you're looking at a million dollars for that building, I'm sure maybe more. And I think we should give them an incentive to try and get this building renovated and fixed up. And I think giving them a reduced tipping fee, uh, and I would say that we would have them tip at, say, two-thirds of the regular rate, uh, which would still generate a fair amount of uh, revenue for the landfill, but at the same time give them an incentive to get this thing uh, done. I wouldn't just hand them 5000 bucks or 10000 or 25000 say, you know, whatever the tipping fee normally is, we'll charge you two-thirds of it, and you pay that, and at the end of uh, whatever June 2020, uh, that no longer applies. You get, have to pay the full pin. That would be an incentive to get their ducks in a row and get that building uh, fixed up. And I think at that time, we would generate some extra tax revenue from having that building and um, I think at the same time would help this organization and get the Park Lane building uh, into a condition that uh, uh, people could actually live in it. If I may comment, uh, I do agree with uh, Councillor Ivanov. I would be prepared to support up to a maximum of 25 using maybe the two-thirds formula. I am deeply concerned that million-dollar figure is probably not too far out of whack. Uh, it's a big risk exposure to the to the town, um, and if that's the incentive to for it to move on, that's my opinion anyway. Now, uh, Councillor White, is it possible to provide this kind of incentive in increments? Can we, as part of the agreement, say we will go five thousand? here at this benchmark and when you increase the value of the property we can go we can entertain the possibility of 5000 more like can we do it in such a way to word it that if you're showing us improvements on that property we can entertain it again up to the maximum and that way we may have more of a I can control. see where I can see where you're going, but if it was me, I would say, well, every time I take out another load of pigeon poop infested asbestos, I'm improving the property. So you're kind of hitting your, your your milestones. Like if we go with the two thirds, but it sounds like you're saying two thirds to a cap of 25, I, I think that's kind of constraining. You'd be either two thirds 
or the two thirds is twenty five. That's two, the, okay. Two thirds is thirty percent. You could always so. um, you could always look at it. Uh, should should council decide on on the on the twenty five thousand dollars, the the two thirds, um, if if the if the Park Lane people should need further assistance beyond that, maybe have have them come to, to council and uh, and Definitely. show you guys the scope of their project. Uh, that that might be an opportunity so they can come and, and say, hey, this is what we're doing, and this is why we need help. Councillor Ivanov? My sense is that renovation is probably somewhere between three to $5 million. And we're talking 5000 bucks on a $5 million project, which is almost stupid, right? I mean, if I was doing that and somebody said to me, I'm not going to help you, I mean, don't give me five grand, because I'm not, you know, I'm talking $5 million, and you're talking, going to give me five grand, that's a pittance. You know, that's... I don't think that that's much of an incentive. I, th I honestly think that when you're looking at something of that magnitude, uh, you know, we have to make it an incentive. And I don't think it, five thousand dollars is an incentive. Councillor Owens, I'd have to agree with Councillor Ivanov on this one. I mean, uh, <coughs> if we end up with that building again, we're going to get screwed. So. And if they are putting a lot of money into it, then you know what? Let's show faith in what they're doing. My only concern is: is there going to be once all this garbage starts coming out, is there going to be extra cost for us at the landfill with this contaminated stuff, or is that assumed by them? Um, the, the extra costs, uh, not necessarily uh, extra work for the for the contractor. Absolutely, um, to have to process the waste. Um, uh, it, it'll take up a large space in the landfill, but that's neither uh, the way I'm thinking is neither here nor there. Uh, if they came and decided to, to, to pay for the tipping fees, it's going to happen. It's going to happen, right? So we still have to deal with it in the landfill perspective. Uh, we will be asking for like the segregation, which is like scrap metals, full of scrap metals, any freon containing appliances that are left in that building that they wish to dispose of. They won't be exempt from the applicable fees because we have to we have to pay somebody to take the freon out of these before we dispose of them. So uh, anything that's freon containing air conditioners, refrigerators, and the like will will, will still be charged an applicable fee for each unit, um, or it could be taken off that, that twenty five thousand dollars. You also are looking at multiple months, so. If you're looking at what you're doing in 2019 and what you're doing in 2020, January, ask them to come in, make a presentation as to where their plans are. They've had the first hit, uh, hit of uh, what's going on. You can then see whether or not, yeah, I got that. Um, you can see whether or not that's going to, it comes when you learn German first and then English. It's very difficult sometimes, it comes back. Um, to see what their plans are if you wish to extend that into the, the next year. I, I agree it is within the CIP parameters. It's stretching it a little bit, right? But uh, it's really going to stretch a budget, but at least then you're, you know, right now you're deferring reven revenue, as you had said with the other issue. It's not something you like, but you're giving them a, a start. Sorry. I do agree, it, and it kind of goes back to what Councillor White was saying. It's, it's like a progress advance. Uh, for approval, uh, I I could live with giving them ten or fifteen thousand, then come back in January. Let's see how far they're going. Councilor Rowan, um, I kind of like you know Eugene's idea. It's something I hadn't thought of, and uh, that's why we have discussions at the council table so we can all get our ideas out. But I like the idea of charging them, even though it's well above the five thousand two-thirds of the tipping fee. That way we've got revenue coming in all the time. We're not doing all this and having no revenue come in. Um, the other question I have is for Rick. Um, how are we actually licensed to take that toxic waste that's going to be coming out of there, or does that have to go somewhere else? How do you mean toxic waste? I'm talking about the droppings of the pigeons, to say it politely. <laughs> I don't believe poop is toxic, but um, that would be up to the health unit to determine that. 
Um, if there's any asbestos and things like that, that's they have to do their asbestos abatement and things like that. We prior to us to, to accept that kind of waste, but um, for toxicology and mold and mildew and pigeon poop, I don't believe that's harmful. Well, uh, it, uh, it would it would that would have to be defined somehow in by the health unit because in my my experience I've never uh, that doesn't come up as, yeah. a, as a toxic waste. Well, I'm just I'm just concerned about what we can and can't take at the dump before we yeah, jump on uh, board here because the, the MOECP won't won't see that as a as a hazard. Uh, um, they see hazardous waste as it's a, it's a whole different criteria. Um, anything in that building, um, I haven't been in there, but I would assume there's nothing in there that would be uh, deemed hazardous unless it's uh, some kind of uh, solvent if you will, or, or something like along those lines. But uh, pigeon scat and mold and mildew would definitely not meet that criteria. I'd like to see something in writing before we start accepting that because I know working in those conditions, you have to be uh, specially dressed and whatever, and there has to be a reason for that. Um, and the other thing that you mentioned was the asbestos. Um, the little I know about it is that you have to remove it you need a, uh, I know we had done it in Northern News, you need a licensed contractor to come in. It all has to be uh, packaged in a certain way and it all has to be sealed off, but it can go to the dump once it's handled properly. Uh, so another concern I would have is that um, hidden amongst the other garbage is gonna be a bunch of asbestos which could potentially put the employees at the uh, at, at the uh, landfill site um, in, in uh, public health situations because asbestos, as long as you don't touch it, is harmless. It's only when it is airborne. And again, it requires special ventilation masks because the, the little sharp pieces that are in the air are so fine, they go through the regular uh, Mass and I, I, and I but having s said all this, I, I could support uh, Eugene's idea of two thirds because it gives us revenue all the way along. Um, but I think I would like an update as of January 1st uh, to see how far along they've gone because um, work seems to start and stop and start and stop on that project, and I don't. I want to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Councillor Ivanov. What I like about the timeline is if you make it two-thirds up until a certain date, then at least you have, there's an incentive to get it done quickly. And instead, of, like Rick says, it stops and starts. If this, if there's an incentive to get it done uh, by June 2020, well, there's the incentive. If you get it done by then, great. If you don't get it done by then, you're going to pay full tipping fees after that fact. So it may be, that may be the incentive they require to get that thing uh, cleaned up. Councillor White? Uh, like Councillor Rick said, that's why we have discussions at the table because I was pretty hard and fast over we've never done it in the past and we shouldn't begin now, especially um, in these economic times. But I have to agree with um, Councillor Ivanov that because of our economic development needs at this time, I would be willing to go to the max of 25,000. Just for some clarification, two thirds with a drop dead date of June of 2020, but with a January update as to what the status is. And if, it, if it, they haven't done anything, then they have to have an explanation. Any fees like free on whatever, that's above and beyond. That's not part of this package. Um, I have to sound like a wet rag, but there is risk of precedent setting. Others will come forward. So in 2020, we have to do, we do have to establish how we're looking at this, what the value is that to measure others. We do have that within the CIP, but I think that council will need to probably revisit that um, and clarify that. Is there anything else from staff that you need? The actual, oh, sorry. 
I'm sorry, Ms. Well, Rick. Yeah. Are you asking Rick? No, no. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Councillor Long. The actual report on the usage could come from staff. It doesn't have to come from the company. Right? I would like to counter that and say that if somebody's sitting here asking for that much money from the taxpayer, they should be making yes. a, re okay. a presentation. Um, again, I still have my concerns that especially, spe well, the other stuff too, which I would like to see something in writing saying that we can accept it and under what conditions we can accept it. I'd like to go back to you and say that uh, Rick can prepare, prepare a short report on what the C of A does not allow. Okay, that's fine. Okay. And, and my other concern is the asbestos bearing products. I, <laughs> I can see that getting put in the dumpster and we're exposing employees and contract employees to asbestos dust, which is something I, I don't know how we're going to monitor. I don't, I really don't, but I'm concerned about it. You actually did put into the report that the waste should be segregated, so segregated and inspected. They'll have, um, no, I'm not sure. I've never renovated a, a building of that size before, but um, in my experience, municipality and, and others that have done such things with maybe not that size but close um, it, the onus is on them to to hire the, um, the professionals in those fields to to for uh, asbestos abatement uh, like in Sulcana is one of the companies that does that and they report to us uh, the onus is on them to ensure that what they're doing over there is legal not us to ensure that what they're doing over there is legal but to revisit, they report to you, so we are aware of what's going on and what could show up at what time. Is that Absolutely, what but if you get a container bin that's uh, you know 30 cubic meters of, of waste, you're not going to go through you're that not go through it. Yeah. and then see what's, right. what's in there, for, uh, tooth and nail, you know. Uh, um, the, the, the onus is on the, on, on, on the, on the companies that, that go in there, and a lot of these companies, uh, they, they know that, uh, so they know what they need to do. They know what they what information they need to get to us, um, and uh, we we rely on that, and they communicate with us, and whether we can accept that waste or not accept that waste. Would that be okay with you? Uh, as far as the pigeons go, um, and the scat, I, I really don't know what to tell you. Um, I, I could ask the health unit. Um, that's uh, yeah. I, I apologize, but I'll, I'll ask the health unit and see. It sounds reasonable. What what yeah. they think of. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, um, <coughs> my my concern is my concern is for the workers. That's that's my concern, and I don't think there's a simple answer to it. I can tell you that about 98 to 99 percent of nine inch by nine inch tiles have asbestos in it. Um, any spray on ceilings from about 1960 backward, maybe a little later than that backward there's a good possibility same with drywall mud um, my concern is a health concern I'm, I'm not concerned about whether they're in compliance I'm concerned about putting workers at the landfills health in jeopardy that that's my concern what we could do is um, I mean if they if they try to go around disposing of that stuff improperly if you will um, we can do spot checks on what's being brought out, and we will do spot checks on what's being brought out. But legally, they need to hire a company that goes in there that specializes in, in, in that abatement, and they go in with the proper PPE, and they, 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 they have to double bag things. They let us know in advance, and then our contractor has areas ready for it to be buried right away, and things like that. But we, we will be doing spot checks. Mm -hmm. Councillor Ivanov. Yeah, my guess, Rick, is with uh, a, a, a project of that magnitude, Department of Labor is going to be there. They've been at that building already. Absolutely. And uh, my sense is they're going to be going through that building with a fine tooth comb to make sure these people are, are in compliance. And I, you know, I think we can worry about all this stuff, but I think, you know, there are provincial uh, organizations that are uh, commissioned with that uh, to make sure that's taken care of. And I, you know, I think we can drive ourselves crazy trying to follow up, but I, I think there really is somebody there that will look at that. I know they, they have been there already. They shut the project down already Absolutely. once, so I think they're going to be in there 
uh, watching those people. So uh, routine inspections, building inspectors. Common. Uh, I think it'll be very common, especially with a building, uh, with that building in that project, uh, the size of that project. Any further discussion? Councillor Adams. So the twenty-five thousand dollars. So does that come out of the operating budget for this year, or how, how does that? Fund? It's deferred, and that's what I was looking at the treasurer for too. I'm sure that she would love to have some kind of. Uh, consolidated number as we get close to the year end that will come from Rick um, I think that you may actually think it uh, may not be surprising to see the company rush forward and hit that $25,000 limit before no, before December anyway right because if they're actually looking at $84,000 worth there's probably quite a bit more likelihood is they'll use up what we have already that's why I suggest It's, it's not a freebie where they, mm -hmm. you know, they have to go on, they have to continue to pay. So it's not going to be where they get 25,000 bucks and then you don't get anything. You know, use up 25,000 and stop fixing it. So if you charge them all the way along, the, the incentive is to continue uh, cleaning up and to do it at a, a quicker pace. And with the tipping fees and that, you're able to handle that or, okay, because then you need to co coordinate with Treasury on it. We can report back to that. Um, I think that as you see it pr progressing, that January uh, presentation to council perhaps that should be done in December so we have a better year-end conclusion I'll talk to uh, Treasurer on it. sorry for Councillor Adams so it's just that for $50,000 if this were to be a part of the community improvement plan and we just let this one happen that's that's half of it so the other applications we have no idea what those applications were and we're just doing that 25 so the process that we voted on would be for this to go to the Economic Development Committee to decide. So the application comes in, it's reviewed by staff, goes to Economic Development, uh, their input is required, and it comes back to Council for a decision. So is this kind of following that process? No, it isn't. And uh, had it come forward just straightforward, I would not bring it forward because it already exceeds the entire budget and uh, their um, I think that, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to collect my thoughts, I saw your hands going up. Um, based on the impact on the municipality, I think it's right to bring it to council to decide whether you even want to entertain it before sending it to a committee to discuss and then chew over. Okay. So that's when we had that discussion at, uh, in, in staff as well about the whole process here. In lieu of actual CIP in place, we went this route. So the other ones that made the application through the community improvement plan, are they going to be told that they can come to council and get approval this way as well? I don't believe that anybody put an application in. It was inquiries as to whether or not uh, the, uh, the the fund was open. Okay. And I think that uh, if we do open the CIP as an uh, actual program, it should go through that course. Um, again, I would ask that if when we see a very exceptional one, uh, maybe oh, I don't know, Boeing is going to come and build a, a jet factory here. We bring that one to council right away so we have guidance on it. But yeah. Councillor White. Sorry, I don't see this as part of the CIP program um, because we do waiving of tipping fees without the CIP program. So I believe this was separate from that specific um, program that we knew we had no money for this year. Um, I definitely see it as an operating hit from that department. So that's where maybe um, Patrick and I disagree a little bit. I would argue you're not disagreeing. It's like I say, it, it's an exceptional case. It's kind of the stuff, but it's not the stuff, you know. It's, um, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a relatively new request. Um, traditionally, we would, you know, grant tipping fees, free tipping fees and, or waivers if you will, on, uh, on residential areas that were demolishing building uh, houses. Yeah. Um, but this is a complete uh, gut renovation. It's a, it's a little unique, it's so it's, it's relatively new. I, 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 where Councillor White's coming from, I, I have the same concerns because if, it, if, it, if the amount we uh, decide for the CIP uh, is 50,000 and 25,000 of it's being used up. It's wiped out half of it already when we open the. No, 
This no. is different. We have, in, well, former council has in the past waived tipping fees for businesses. Um, the property at 470 Government Road West, as a business, was allowed, um, was allocated that 5,000. Um, so I do see this not as part of the CIP P. program at all. This is something different that we've set precedent. The town of Kirkland Lake has set precedent before by waiving yeah. fees for companies. This is not a CIP to me at all. And that prevents it from setting a precedence in the future then. Mm. Councillor Owen. <coughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to remember in the CIP that there was a maximum figure that each business could get, and I believe it was five thousand dollars. Was yeah. it not? There's also exceptions within the CAP that if you want to go above and beyond, it has to go to council for consideration. So the, I, I see where he's coming from as well, because the CIP does actually stay within it that fee user fees can be either reduced or eliminated as part of the community improvement plan. But again, we have that provision, and if there's exceptional cases where it's going to make a big difference, council has the ability to go above and beyond. Yeah, but a normal amount. CIP. Maximum. application the maximum is per project per is five thousand yeah. dollars and we're looking at a lot more than five thousand dollars here and we're looking at an extraordinary case and the effect it could have on the, the ratepayers and and the downtown atmosphere so I think it was right to bring this to council first and, uh, it's important to note that because of the uniqueness of the request and when it came in that's it's not something we we planned for and budgeted for accordingly Sorry. Yeah, so so I don't see this as part of the CIP either. I just think it's probably increased revenue for the landfill because there's going to be a substantial amount of, of uh, refuge going into the landfill. So I think when you do your budgeting process, I'm not sure how Sherry's going to work that out, but I would think that it's it's not. It's going to be increased income at two-thirds of the regular price for that amount of uh, garbage that gets into the uh, landfill site. So I think you're going to see increased revenue. Uh, go ahead. It'll still be noted as a loss because it's still going to reflect this much came in. Yeah. So you'll still have a deferred, like a. Okay. So that. It's yeah. As it, long as you can figure out the bookkeeping, I'm good with yeah, it. Yeah, it's it's a bookkeeping thing, but it'll show. It's not going to show as additional revenue. It'll be a loss. There'll be a loss noted. Councillor Adams. I'm only confused on the CIP, uh, just uh, section 6.6, .6, building renovation improvement grant, which specifically speaks to this item. It is a CIP issue, but I understand completely as to that this is a lot larger, and that's why it's at this point. But 6.6, .6, building renovation improvement grant, is very specific to uh, these types of items. Joanne, what do you come up with? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're both thinking the same thing. You don't have a CIP in place yeah, right now, exactly. yeah. right? So this is your a case before the uh, the council before to decide, and yeah, yeah, and you're carrying it forward. Okay. I have a motion that's moved by Councillor Casey Owens, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier. The council has received the report request to waive landfill tipping fees for the re revitalization work on the former Park Lane, and direct staff to implement option two as presented to be completed no later than June 2020, to offer two-third tipping fees to owner with maximum town contribution to 25,000. The waste is to be segregated and an update be brought back to council by the owner in December 2019. Are we comfortable with that? Any further discussion? All in favor? Pass. <laughs> yeah. I have one more report. Okay, so the last report I have to present is a request to purchase from Gary Hodgins for $500. It's a corner lot. It's a 50 by 40 lot, so not, not developable by any means. 
Uh, Mr. Hodgins brought in Phil to slope the property in a safe manner and has since maintained the property by cutting grass. It's this is since the, I think it's the 80s that he's been doing that. Um, that's why we're recommending uh, approval of the $500 price tag. So typically when we sell land, we are roughly selling for about 75 cents per square foot when it's in addition to a property. Um, this is a slightly reduced rate because of the work that was done on the property before the, for the amount of years that he's lived there. So we are recommending approval of this um, of this purchase um, and de declaring the property as surplus land. Other questions? I would support <coughs> support that uh, I'm in close proximity to that property and, and uh, go by there daily. Uh, certainly he has maintained maintained that portion that he's looking at buying and that strip of land is basically useless to anybody. He could never build on it. It just enhances the size of his property. So And the fact that he's kept it uh, maintained it, leveled it off, and uh, cut the grass over the years, several years. Uh, the reduced amount uh, is reasonable. Any other comments? Joanne? Okay, these are, we have two bylaws that are associated with this property, and since Councillor White has left the room, I thought it would be good to do the two bylaws now. So it's moved by Councillor Casey Owens, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier that bylaw 19-091 being a bylaw to authorize Mayor and Clerk to execute all documents related to the sale of 1 Brown Avenue to Gary Hodgins be read a first, second, third time and acted and passed. All in favor? Passed. Okay, and the next bylaw has to do with the deeming of the lot, so that's merging them together. It's moved by Councillor Rick Owen, seconded by Councillor Casey Owens, that bylaw 19-092 being a bylaw to deem lots 142 and 143 of registered plan M109T, which is 1 Brown Avenue, not to be registered, be read a first, second, and third time, and acted and passed. All in favor? Passed. Unanimous. Reading and consideration of bylaws. It's moved by Councillor Casey Owens, seconded by Councillor uh, Dennis Perrier. The bylaw 19 086, being a bylaw to authorize Mayor and Clerk to execute an agreement with the Center of Geographic Information Systems, CGIS, to provide spatial land information management system services, be read a first, second, and third time, and acted and passed. All in favor? Unanimous moved by Councillor Casey Owens, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier, the bylaw 19-088 being a bylaw to authorize Mayor and Clerk to execute all documents related to the sale of lots on Hilton Avenue to Josh Fuller be read a first, second, third time and acted and passed. All in favor? <coughs> Unanimous passed. It's moved by Councillor Casey Owens, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier, that bylaw 19-089 being a bylaw to name members to committees of council by adding Crystal Gorman to the Recreation Committee be read a first, second, third time and acted and passed. All in favor? Passed. Unanimous. It's moved by Councillor Casey Owens, seconded by Councillor Dennis Perrier. The bylaw 19-090 being a bylaw to authorize Mayor and Clerk to execute an agreement with 1381763 on Ontario Limited to allow storage containers at 18 Prospect Avenue be read a first, second, third time, and acted and passed. All in favor? Passed. Unanimous. It's moved by Councillor Rick Owen, seconded by Councillor Casey Owens, that bylaw 19-093 being a bylaw to authorize Mayor and Clerk to execute an agreement with Octant Aviation Inc. for a cyclical review of instrument procedures at the airport under RFP-543-19 be read a first, second, third time and acted and passed. All in favor? Passed. Unanimous.
No questions uh, from councilor to staff. Uh, notice of motions. None declared. Confirmation bylaw. It's moved by councilor Rick Owens, seconded by councilor Casey Owens, that bylaw 19-094, being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of council at its meeting held September 3rd, 2019, we read a first, second, third time, and acted and passed. All in favor? Passed unanimous. Councillors' reports. Councillor Adams. Yep. So uh, at our recent DSAB meeting, August 21st, uh, one of our uh, items on the agenda was a funding increase of uh, $42,000 for a project for the additional renovation costs at the new Lisker Stepping Stone Daycare. The increase was required because a tender was made on an opinion of probable construction costs. This type of quote has a list of exclusions that are specifically not budgeted for. Class D estimates all over it. Um, pretty much at this point, uh, what we have done is we gave direction to uh, staff at DSAB to come up with ideas as to how to prevent these things from happening again. And for other members of other boards, when you are uh, having tender requests come forward, please make sure that these things are not under the classification of a Class D estimate because the DSAB is lucky enough to have strong reserves of $42,000. If not, this was at our municipality level, we'd be going back to taxpayers and requesting $42,000 on top of what the project already was. So try and put the controls in place on the boards that you're on as well, uh, just like we did here. Um, and just be aware that these things do exist. It's nothing worse than coming back and uh, seeing that there was a list of exclusions with the uh, tender amount. So uh, just be careful out there to other counselors on the boards that you sit on. Well put. Any other reports? Uh, I attended uh, Northern College orientation and student welcoming uh, uh, presentation this morning. Uh, I'm pleased to say I believe enrollment is up at Northern College uh, approximately 16 percent which for Kirkland Lake campus which is a positive uh, Timmins is up a similar amount uh, was well attended by new students and it was nice to see uh, we're getting a fair share of uh, foreign students coming to the college so it was uh, an enjoyable morning and uh, informative It's moved by Councillor Rick Owen, seconded by Councillor Casey Owens. The Council adjourns its regular meeting of September 3rd, 2019 to an in-camera meeting pursuant to Section 239.2 of the Municipal Act to discuss two potential property sales and one potential lease agreement. All in favour? Unanimous. Adjourned.